all of us soothing our souls, challenging us about love, life, politics, etc. I'm talking about the late Ray Chikapa Piri Mukongwana. Shall we, ladies and gentlemen, please give this man Ray Piri a round of applause and say thank you. May his soul rest in peace. Mrs. Mkari, you owe me something. Uh, thank you. So if, if I t say something that is out of order, you know who wrote all the questions. <laughs> um, oh, oh that's, that's the killer one, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's probably... <laughs> so, um, officially, once again, a special welcome to all the Power people on Power 98.7, um, my homeboys and girls in Limpopo on listening to us on, on Capricorn FM, as well as the viewers uh, of ENCA. And uh, a big thank you to our guest on honor, the inaugural guest, and deservedly so, of uh, something I've committed publicly that I'll do every year uh, from now onwards. And we couldn't think as a team of a better person to. To, um, to, to start this with, other than yours truly, it was the Africa, uh, President Tawambeke. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, that's okay. okay. That's more like it. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Um, and a special thank you as well to a young lady who is still looking so hot, uh, who delivered him tonight, Mrs. Zanellenbeke. <laughs> Do you remember the first time you met her? Do you think I want to remember the first time? I met her? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> you know, you know the, people talk about uh, uh, ladies who mature like red wine. Mm. Um, is she reflecting that red wine? Because she's she just keeps blowing it. I mean, Moshe Mama yes. <laughs> you do agree? I agree. I agree. I... <laughs> yes, no, I agree entirely. <laughs> yeah. So, so thank you for bringing him, uh, this pensioner, to, to South Africa. They miss him a lot. So, see our mama that you would share him with, with us. I, I want us to start this conversation. I did say I was on Iman's show today. I did say to the power listeners that um, I am not a talk show host. I am not a journalist. So I will not do an interview. Um, we'll have a conversation. We asked the power people over the past three, four weeks to send us a set of questions that they would like to ask you. So, um, you know I'm a nice guy. I know, I know. Um, <laughs> so... If there's something that is said that doesn't sound like me, it's it not be you. because it's them. Yes. <laughs> it's the power listeners. Quite, quite. Yes, and uh, in a few Twitteratis. And by the way, our hashtag tonight is uh, hashtag big on power. I'll explain what hashtag means a little I bit. Um, <laughs> it's hashtag big on power. <laughs> and um, you, know, you know, I have tried all my life for as long as I've known President Beki to say, Chief, Nukombla sell number, man. You know, to date, I don't have a cell number. And I can't remember ever asking anything from you, any decline. This, but one, this, this one, one, you are not going to get. <laughs> and you know why? Please. Can I say this? Please do. Given always gives me problems. <laughs> uh, happy birthday to Power FM. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> I had to do an interview with Power FM at his insistence to launch it. Uh, I, I hesitated to do this because uh, I, I think it's incorrect for me to endorse particular radio stations. So we reached a deal that I, I, would, I would say something about how power should conduct itself. Yes. Don't ask me to give an assessment. <coughs> uh, 
But that's why you won't get a cell phone number. <laughs> well, so, so it used to bother me until I'm going to out you. The president doesn't have a cell phone. <laughs> so you have no number. <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I want to go back a bit. I want to go back to to talk about this aloof, stubborn, arrogant, difficult dictator. Um, you know, Trevor, you can drop some more names because you worked, you worked for him. Um, and and I've often wondered if that is true. Why is that? Um, I want to go back to something that Paul has been doing. Um, in his own words, talking about how he was brought up, if we may. Guys? The inaugural chairman's conversation this Thursday with former state president Thabo Mbeki on Power 98.7. We grew up in a, in a political family. That meant that uh, we got exposed to this challenge of having to respond to the apartheid system. There wasn't uh, any sort of direct instruction, but I'm saying growing up in that kind of situation, uh, which among other things, you, you learn to, to read a lot because uh, it's that kind of, of, of household. Uh, so the habit of trying to discover, to find out things, to check what is reality, thinking, and all of that, is something that, that, that we were, were brought up with. All of us as children did not grow up with the parents, and the reason for it was because they, uh, they knew that uh, they, they would get arrested and would have to spend a long time in jail. And so they wanted us to grow up uh, in their absence. So from the age of nine, ten, we left home and stayed with relatives and friends and so on. The inaugural chairman's conversation this Thursday. Hashtag Mbeki on power. So, so, so President Mbeki talks about um, growing up um, and spending quite minimal time with with the parents, and somehow that um, the parents had already figured out that um, at some stage they may be severed from their children. Um, but let's go to when you get expelled uh, at Lovedale as, as a student, and you are, sh oh, <laughs> and you only spoke English, you are scared um, <laughs> <laughs> um, to. Um, about why is it that your father won't raise this thing with you? Let, 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 let's go back to, to that moment, um, um, Gav and, and you, um, and your ex, you, you, you being expelled from Latin. Well, I wouldn't say given that I was scared. Uh, well, what happened is that we get expelled uh, from, from boarding school Lovedale. My father was uh, working in Port Elizabeth. It's editing the new age, uh, not the current one. <laughs> no, not, not. <laughs> um, so, 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 Mr. President, earlier on I said I'll talk to you about um, a hashtag. What you've just done, we call it a subtweet. <laughs> Is that so? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, given not the current new age. Yeah. No, no, no. The original new age in PE. So uh, then we get expelled from school and I go to join my mother in the trans sky. So we are we're out of school for the final year metric year which means must sit at home and study at home and write at home and pass. So, um, so I was interested to find out, why, my mother said, well done. Long live Viva. 
Then I was interested to find out what my father thought. Because he knows about the, the, the student strike because he reported on it. Mm. Um, but he was quiet. So I raised this with my mother. I said, you know, what does he say? She said, write to him. So I said, okay. So I wrote to him. As you know, we went on strike. You reported on this. And so now I'm at the home, la da da. What do you think? So he wrote back and said, uh, there were no cell phones then, so you couldn't. Uh, <laughs> so he wrote and said, uh, when, when you enter into an agreement with other people to join, to, to do whatever, it's important that you always keep your word. And that's all he said. And that was the end. <laughs> now, whether he approved or disapproved, I don't know. <laughs> uh, to this day. But just keep your word when you, uh, when you make a commitment in a collective like that. And, so, and, and a lot of people who have spent years with you would say that once you bite, you know like that dog that doesn't let go of the bone. That once you bite, once you're convinced, based on rationality, um, it's not easy to move you. They say that. They say you're a man of conviction. Um, in most cases, depending on who you ask, by the way, if you ask Trevor, Trevor will say, um, once you buy into principle, you stick by principle. And then if you were to ask um, Vavi, at, at least 10 years ago. <clears throat> or you ask Juju uh, 10 years ago. Um, Dora said, no, I'm a man. He's so in love with his own ideas. And I got you. No, it, uh, <clears throat> you see, David, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, uh, given what we had to do, my generation, we were in, struggle, in the struggle since very young years. Grew up in the struggle. In the end, we get into government, etc. Throughout the course of that process, uh, you are obviously involved in taking important decisions. You take an important decision, or you are part of, or you have to adopt, or uh, agree to whatever, but it's a whole series of important decisions. Uh, the ANC gets banned, what do we do? Got to act in a particular way. In contra we see the formed, what do we do? Got to act in a particular way. Possibility exists to uh, uh, enter into negotiations with the apartheid regime, what do we do? Uh, and so on. These are all important decisions and it's necessary that you must stick to what has been decided, surely. You, you can't take what is an important decision for opportunistic reasons and then say that uh, since the wind is blowing this way now, let me run away from this decision. You can't. So it's not a matter of, uh, <clears throat> I think, circumstances would oblige people to stick by what has been agreed, uh, which hopefully are things, are decisions that are taken bearing in mind the importance of principle, the importance of particular value systems, uh, and therefore <clears throat> I think it would be dishonorable to turn against decisions of that but kind. You see, some, some of those decisions got you fired. Which is which, uh, right? Which you is lost fine. a job. You are a pensioner now. Which is fine. That's all right. <laughs> Um, so, take gear. Um, the, the, the 1996 class project. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this hogging of a principle at all costs. You lost very close friends. Certainly, or some whom we would have believed were friends, but maybe they were colleagues. Um, 
you provoked external very powerful forces, pharmaceutical companies. Um, you provoked serious organizations with money, the IMFs of this world, when they say, here's money, borrow, borrow, you and your, your tea friends, Ruth, Tito, uh, Trevor, Tabo, the triple T's I call them. <laughs> and uh, by the way, there are triple M's as well. It's Tabo Mbegi, Tito Mboweni, Trevor Manuel. <laughs> Something's happening there, right? Um, conviction, we are not going to borrow. We're going to tighten up our belts. Yes, we are committed to RDP, but we need a, an economically credible policy. And, and gear would have been that intervention. You don't like sound bites. You don't want praise overtly. You don't tell Vavi to say, Chief, um, are you equal We still need to build. We haven't divorced um, RDP. It's part of the bigger game. You go, no, if it's correct, if it's good for the country, we do it. We don't, not going to do sound bites and over explain. We'll just get on with it. But also, in principle, you get the ANC to adopt it in conference. So it's, it's official policy of the organization. It is government policy. But your friends turn against you. Kevin, you are raising matter about gear. Can I suggest that for that particular one? Yes. I exchanged seats with Trevor. <laughs> um, you see, if I allow that, Mkabis Jonas is here, Trevor will pass on the button saying, Mkabis is the former deputy. <laughs> you know, and, and we won't win. So maybe a QA he, he can reinforce. Yeah. <clears throat> no, you see the. Uh, it's a part of uh, what, what, what uh, a matter that has concerned me, uh, uh, given for many years, mm. is that it's, it's very necessary for us to, to understand properly who we are, what we want to do, what kind of results we want. To think. To think and uh, not, not, not to be influenced by things simply because they've been repeated 20 times in the newspaper. It doesn't mean they're necessarily correct because they've been so repeated. You see, <clears throat> it take the gear thing. You know, when many people who talk about uh, class of 1996 will forget <clears throat> that the RDP, the document, in black and white says, when our government takes power, can it please take care of the microeconomic, the macroeconomic imbalances in our economy? Mm -hmm. It's a directive, it's in the RDP. So we act according to what the RDP has said. Now, this thing is then suggested that it's Trevor Manuel and uh, uh, Maria Ramos, and so assisted by me, who then decide, wake up one morning to say, uh, what about gear? <laughs> it's a directive. It's in the RDP document. Please take care of the macroeconomic imbalances. And they mention what they are because they are obvious. You see, when we come into government, the, the government deficit was too big and was growing. It was a deliberate process by the National Party because it wanted to buy itself into power and therefore borrowed money in order to bribe people. So, so we come into... This bribing thing is not new, huh? It's no, it isn't. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So, so what, is, what is clear to us, given in government, is that if we don't change this, what's going to happen? is that we are going to end up borrowing money to service this debt so that every tax cent that you raise goes to the money lenders, not to development or to building a clinic and a school and giving a social grant and so on. You'll be paying the money lenders. And we said we can't have a situation like that. And so you've got to make sure that you reduce 
this budget deficit. That is what is denounced as a class of 1996. <clears throat> it would have led us, if we had sustained that, uh, large public debt, big borrowing, high interest rates, and so on, it would have led us straight into the IMF and the World Bank. You could never have avoided it. And we said we don't want to go to the IMF and the World Bank because they are going to dictate policy. So we keep our policy in our hands. We can't over borrow. You see what's happened uh, recently? Trevor, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I don't know how recent. <coughs> Trevor will talk about this. You know, we've always had in the budget when we're in government a strategic reserve. Uh, in case there is uh, some emergency somewhere, there must be public funds which you can use to address the emergency. I read a couple of years back, maybe two years back, that they had raided the strategic reserve in order to pay salaries of civil servants. Yeah. And wiped it out. It's wrong. <clears throat> it's wrong, you see, because I'm saying, you, you are a government. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day, uh, Given is going to say that Power FM has collapsed and the country is collapsing, please give me five rand. But you spent all of it to finance salaries. Not to finance building a road or a factory or something. But it's current expenditure. We wanted to avoid that and did. You, 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 see, mm, you see what happens. Mm. <clears throat> you then have this crisis which emerges in the United States, 2008. Mm -hmm. Uh, when the big banks do all of these criminal things and uh, virtually the global financial system collapses. And they do whatever they do in America. But that impacts on everybody. If we look at the statements that were made here, 2008, 2009, we have not suffered as badly on this, about this thing as we could have. And that was true. And why? Because in the previous years, we were prepared for exactly that kind of eventuality. That's why South Africa could say we have survived. <clears throat> so that is the class project, 1996. Now, <laughs> so, 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 so we've got reserves, the economy is pumping on all cylinders, um, but as South Africans come to, have come to understand, they'll say, you know, I hear you that, but still it was a, a jobless growth, unemployment, you didn't do much for unemployment. So this economy actually worked for those who were employed, um, they did well, but those that were locked out, didn't do much for them. Correct, yes. The, uh, the, the levels of unemployment here uh, have been increasing over time. So they didn't don't start now, during when we were in government. Mm -hmm. Indeed, you are quite correct. The, uh, the, 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 the challenge, and the Vavi raises this thing all the time quite correctly, uh, the challenge to eradicate unemployment is an important one. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, I, was, I started by saying, given that mm. it's really very important that we must think uh, all the time and not, uh, not just be driven by what might be a popular slogan. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, he did not say WMC yet. We'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. Uh, f for this economy to grow like, an, like any other. For this economy to grow, it needs new investment and higher rates of investment. That means new factories. New factories, new mines, new all of these things. Um, that's one thing. Second, the consideration that relates to that, you invest what you have saved. The savings ratio in this country is very low. 
For instance, it will be between, in terms of GDP, it will be between 16 and 17 percent. Yeah. In China, it's over 50 percent. Russia, 30. India, 30. Here, I'm saying between 16 and 17 percent. We do not generate enough capital to build new factories, and therefore create jobs. So what should we do? We have to get other people elsewhere in the world who've got this capital to say, please, can you bring that capital here so that we can build new factories? Mm -hmm. If you look at China, since 1979, when Deng Xiaoping and his others said, let's have this open door policy, what they were opening the door to was these larger flows of capital into China. And hence China develops the way it does, in addition to whatever the domestic capital it generates. Now, so here we are in South Africa, so we must say, we need larger volumes of investment uh, to create, to build new factories. It's not happening at the rate that is necessary to happen, which would reduce unemployment. So we must ask the question why. Mm -hmm. you, you will see, for instance, in recent reports, it's not a new problem, it's an old problem that uh, a lot of your South African corporations maintain very high levels of liquidity. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phenomenon which was raised with us in government directly by other foreign business people. Particularly, Trevor will remember, we used to have what was called an International Investment Council, which was made up of these foreign business people whom we allowed, we, we asked them to say, give us an honest opinion about us mm -hmm. and what you think needs to happen. And one of the things they raised was this one, that they noticed that South African corporations maintain a red, too high a level of liquidity, abnormal. Mm -hmm. It was abnormal, it doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. Why is that? Mm -hmm. I'm saying more recently you'll read the same thing that huge volumes of money are in our banks from our corporate sector, mm -hmm. they're not being invested in the economy. Why is that? Why is that? That's a question that we've got to answer. Not with slogans. Uh, <clears throat> but, but, but honestly, <clears throat> I mean, if I tell you my honest view, I'm not sure that it's wise to, to speak honestly about this. Let, 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 uh, let me remind you. So, so um, beautiful speech. I don't know how many of us have uh, read his, uh, his birthday speech, his 76th birthday speech. Um, and the reason why you should feel free is because you are an elder. So you are allowed, you, you, you can get away with it now. Is that so? Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you don't, you're not chasing votes. Um, how Actually, you know? those who have voted for you are here. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're on ENC and Power and Capricorn and all over the country. You, you said no, you, speech, see the, uh, you, you, can, you can afford to just let it out. You see, uh, um, given part of the problem with regard, with regard to these high levels of liquidity, I'm not saying it's the only one. Mm. There may very well be others, but part of the problem has been that a lot of your owners of capital in the country since 94 have always thought that the transition was too good to be true. Mm. That it was inevitable because after all South Africa is yet another African, African country. country. So something is going to break. Something, yeah, something is bound to break at yeah. some point. Now, and I might have to run. Mm. Now I can't... Uh, you can't pick up a factory and run with it. <laughs> <laughs> but you can pick up a, a, a briefcase of cash and take it to Dubai or someplace.
I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm saying that this is a, a part of the reason for these unnaturally high levels of liquidity maintained by the South African companies. Confidence issue a, a, a confidence about the future of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, we aren't confident enough. So <clears throat> I'm saying you've had this problem. There is a, some kind of disjuncture mm -hmm. uh, between those who've exercised state power since 94 mm -hmm. and those who control capital. Uh, it's matter has been raised, has been raised incidentally by, uh, by some people in the, in the corporate sector, white people, mm -hmm. uh, senior managers, who've raised exactly the same question to say we need to bridge this gulf of mistrust, lack of cooperation between the corporate sector and the political power. I'm saying that's part of the problem. Afro president. That's part of the problem relating to the economy not growing at rates that would enable us to be able to re reduce levels of unemployment. If we don't do these investments and so on, and that, the unemployment levels are going to retain, remain high. And, and so, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah. there's an issue that's mm. raised correctly mm. that uh, historically across the world, the, the corporate companies that, that generate jobs would be your small and medium businesses. Mm. Sure, let's take that as given, and you, uh, all sorts of examples can be produced to show that. Uh, so we need also to look at. Uh, what is it that we need to do in order to make sure that you have that greater volume of those companies? It's a practical question. You must also have a look uh, at, there's an issue that again has been raised correctly, that there has been a process of deindustrialization. Mm -hmm. uh, it's correct, I said what's happened then we must ask ourselves the question why. It relates to the first issue that I raised. You see, you, you can't produce a product in 2017 in the modern world using technology that was in use in 2000. It's overtaken by the development of technology. So if you don't invest in new technology and do new research and so on in order to be able to catch up with the global market with regard to these things, of course you are going to deindustrialize. Because somebody else is going to produce this thing uh, better than you do. We had, uh, at some point we had uh, uh, Minister Mpatio. Uh, mm -hmm. Minister of Trade and Industry, yeah, yeah. Mandisi. Uh, and he had to speak to his Chinese counterpart mm -hmm. to say, please, can you people do something about the export to South Africa of clothing and textiles? Because the export of Chinese clothing and textiles to South Africa are killing our firms yes. here. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Fortunately, the Chinese agreed, and the particular minister at the time in China, the chair would remember his name, uh, unfortunately is in jail now for corruption. <coughs> oh, uh, so, uh, so they do, some of politicians, corrupt politicians in some countries do end up in jail. It, he ended up in jail, yeah, for corruption. <laughs> uh, <coughs> that was not a subtweet. No, but before he did, he actually acted on it. And one of the things the Chinese did was to say, we are going to help your companies in South Africa to modernize their equipment. Because this te technological change, even in, with regard to clothing mm. and textiles, mm. has changed. Mm. And your companies have been caught up. I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pause The totality of all of this, yeah, yeah, given, yeah. is that, you see, 
uh, what we need today in South Africa is really a thorough, systematic look at all of these challenges that mm. we're raising. Mm. What is the cause for low rates of investment? What is the reason for this industrialization? Mm. Da, 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 da. And therefore, what are the things that we need to do to, to impact on that? That's what is necessary, yeah. Yeah. and I'm afraid it's not happening. So, 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 so we talk about economic interventions that must happen. But also, you seem to suggest, and actually you're quite bold about it, that other than the business of business, there are other soft but very tangible uh, factors that may inform the behavior of business. Afro-pessimism. Um, and, and I think you used to talk a lot about this in your presidency around how, how can business be so invested in a people, a leadership, and a group of people that they first and foremost don't, don't, don't believe in? Um, you also said that for some business, actually, this freedom was too good to be true, so something had to give. I want us to take a step back and go, you are 75 now. A young man sometime in 1994 would have been about 52 has the task of building a government, build systems, uh, employ a public se a service that works, uh, security services that ensure that people are safe, um, and get on with it. That young man um, is about to start today, Mr. President. He's 52. His name is Tabombeki. Uh, I'm sitting with a, a Tabombeki now at 75 who's traveled that journey. Can you spend a bit of time and give him three tips on what not to do as he starts? It is 1994. Madiba has said, um, Madiba has said, I will do the lovey davy I will guide you um, high level, but you do the work. You do the runarounds. You run the administration. This young man is getting this brief now. This organization has never governed, I nearly said English again, it never governed anything. You have the benefit of being 75. Mama, I know he's still very busy, but hopefully you still have a bit of time to just reflect. With the benefit of space and time and hindsight, let's give that young man, the Deputy President of the Republic, who actually is most likely to be the only one ANC President who will have so much time in office for the rest of the life of the ANC because you had more than just, not just two terms, but also in Mandela's time, you were running the show. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, I suppose, uh, uh, given what one would have to say uh, to that 52-year-old who's coming into government now, one of the things would be to say, bear in mind that uh, access to state power uh, can be abused for self-enrichment. And so do whatever is necessary to ensure that these people that you are working with in government don't abuse that access to state power for that purpose. Um, I think that's one thing. That's one thing that we would want to say from our experience. Right. Quite how you do that is a, is a detailed question, which is not terribly easy to answer, mm. because it, it it's obvious that the the crooked people are much more agile on their feet <laughs> <laughs> than. Uh, <laughs> No, it's true, than the non-crooked. Yeah. I would say the second thing uh, uh, given, which I've said before, is uh, avoid being driven by what appears to be popular opinion and uh, uh, sexy slogans. You got to look at the, at the reality, the actuality that we got to deal with. We are here today and we want to be there tomorrow. 
how do we get there? And I'm saying to avoid being caught by fashion. Mm -hmm. um, so you must be able to justify the steps that you are taking. Not on the basis that you are going to get a very good newspaper headline. But because what you're going to say is going to, is a pro, going to produce a positive result that you need. It's, it's very important because, uh, you see, you, you referred it to this thing earlier. You know, you've got some people now talking about white monopoly capital. What is that? <laughs> uh, you see, first of all, it's an abuse of, of a phrase, of a term, a concept, which was used in scientific economic literature, which talked about monopoly capital. And monopoly capital in this sense, that you have, uh, this is in all of the economics books, uh, <clears throat> You said the beginning of the capitalist system, mm -hmm. you have many firms, many factories, mm -hmm. many small capitalists. There is not any one of them who is so big as to influence what happens on the market. Right. So you have a market system, a capitalist market system, uh, which is non-monopoly. But the economic textbooks will also tell you that it's in the nature of capital to swallow others. So inevitably, a capitalist system is going to result in concentration and centralization of capital. Mm -hmm. So out of the thousand firms in this sector, ultimately we are going to end up with six. Right. That is what is then called monopoly capital in order to, to contrast it with this non-monopoly non stage when there is no firm big enough to influence the market. Now you've got half a dozen which are big enough to influence what happens in the market. Mm -hmm. That's what they called monopoly capital. Not monopoly in the sense of the existence of only one company, right. which is what monopoly means, the word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying in the... <laughs> uh, I'm saying that in the economic literature, the monopoly capitalism is understood as a stage when you've got fewer numbers of firms, so big that they can, they may be six or eight or ten or whatever, uh, so big that they can then influence the market. That's what is described as monopoly capital. Right. Then somebody here, uh, somewhere, <clears throat> adds the word white. And then they quote these famous names that you've heard as exemplars of this white monopoly capital, the Oppenheimers, the Roberts, and I don't know what I think Fev was one of them, is it? No, 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 not yet. <coughs> uh, or, or at least his madame <coughs> leads one of them. Maria is uh, the face of white monopoly capital. <laughs> she runs Absa. Now, so they, um, I'm saying you have people then add to what is the scientific category? Right. Monopoly capital. They add the head went white, which turns it into a political category. Because if you look at uh, the structure of capital in South Africa since 94, remember I'm talking to a 52 year old. Yeah, of course. Of course. I'm saying to him, I'm therefore saying to him, but if study what has happened to the structure of capital in South Africa since 94, mm -hmm. it's changed. It's changed. In what sense? For instance, <clears throat> if you look at the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, probably something like 40% of the capital represented on the Johannesburg Securities Exchange is foreign capital. It's not South African. Why do you call it white? Well, there are no Afri most Africans All right. who would have the money, so they are most likely to be white. All right. And then look at uh, 
the, uh, the pension funds. Mm -hmm. What proportion of the JSC does the PIC account? And this is public employees' mm -hmm. pension funds. Quite substantial. It's quite substantial. Mm -hmm. Or take uh, Vavis comrades. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the very good things about NUMSA mm -hmm. is that NUMSA has developed a very, very strong pension fund for the benefit of the members of NUMSA. It's, a very, it's very good indeed. Mm -hmm. Guaranteed it's, uh, better pensions for the workers when they retire. It's a very big pension fund. Mm -hmm. Where is it invested? Mm -hmm. JSE? Mm -hmm. So I'm saying if you, wait, wait. why do you think you want Rupert? Former, the former chairperson of uh, ESCOM pension fund, Shengen Matevil is in the house. They also have a lot of money. They, well, they used to, I hope they still have, um, they used to have a lot of money in the ESCOM pension fund. No, I was saying that if you look at Yuan Rupert, uh, and I mean, he says this publicly, and it's known that he's the chairman of uh, Verishmo. Mm -hmm. uh, foreign company owns all sorts of these luxury brands and so on. Mm -hmm. Because the opening up of the South African economy meant that your South African capitalists could, uh, could diversify. Or some would say escape. Well, if you want to use that word. So... If you look at the accounts of Remgro, you remember Remgro, mm -hmm. the Rembrandt Group, mm -hmm. the typical uh, uh, Rupert company. 7% mm -hmm. of the equity of that company is owned by the Ruperts. Mm -hmm. Seven. Mm -hmm. Because they have uh, diversified because of the opening up of the South African economy. But now I'm saying to you, 52 year old, mm -hmm. Don't imagine that the South African capital market in 2017 mm -hmm. is the same as it was in 1994. It right. isn't. Right. It's changed. And is this unique to South Africa or around the globe? It's, it's global. The, change is the process. Global. It's changed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when somebody comes to you to say the principal enemy of the National Democratic Revolution is white monopoly capital and these are the... <laughs> Say, uh, uh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, uh. You should say, wait. I know the role of monopoly capital. And let's discuss that. Mm. Even as it would relate to South Africa. Mm. Now, when, when you say to me, you... Uh, Deputy President. This, this is the 52 year old. Order. Yeah. This is who's talking now, the 75 year old. It talk, talking and the young the man is still listening. Does he yeah. listen, by the way? This He's young listening, man? yeah. Does he listen, though? He's listening. Okay. So I say to this 52 year old, now you see, if, if you go to people and say white monopoly capital is the enemy of the National Democratic Revolution, you are then suggesting to me that I must take action against this enemy. Otherwise, what's the point of pointing out an enemy? Uh, who is this enemy? Mm. You are obliged to say, Johan Rupert. Mm. I don't know what you're going to do with Johan. They trash him or something. No, or, no, no. You, you, you go to Stellenbosch. It's not him alone. You go and gather them, all of them, around those mountains and you deal with them. So this is what I'm saying to the 52-year-old. Therefore, let's understand properly. What is happening to the South African capitalist economy? So that we can then intervene to do the right thing. Because if we misdiagnose the problem, the cure is going to be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so, the other guys who are advising the... And we're going to need to wrap up now before we go to news. Um, in about two, three minutes. The, the other guys who are whispering to the 52-year-old to say, no, 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 it's white monopoly capital. Are they doing that out of arrogance or is there a sly, um, funny motive behind wanting to out WMC? And I'm going to try, I'm going to ask you to give me at least um, a, a quick response to that. And I know you don't like soundbites, it's not a soundbite. Um, 
I'm is saying it out uh, of ignorance or there's a it is obviously part of ignorance yes but uh, I, I'm saying that it is to politicize a, a scientific category to what end for political purposes obviously assuming that if you don't do that then you lose a platform of a campaigning platform that this will be your ideal one that works the most no no you may very well believe this to be correct ah. uh, <clears throat> You may very well believe it to be correct, but the fact that you believe that it's correct does not make it correct. <laughs> all, all right, so, so remember, that was a 75-year-old mm -hmm. advising the 50-year-old, 52-year-old. Um, so I'm going to suggest that we pause for now um, because while we're in this room, stuff is happening outside. There's some guys in Boxberg that are meeting, for example, uh, Blade and the Friends, and some people are campaigning somewhere in the villages and the towns, and other people are enjoying time uh, doing all sorts of things. So I want us to, take, uh, to go into news and we'll continue this conversation. You are on Power 98.7. Capricorn FM.
Thank you to the power people. Thank you to the Capricorn FM family, our friends at um, ENCA, our partners, the Tabon Beggy Foundation, uh, Old Mutual, BCX. Uh, we are live uh, from, we still haven't said from where, from some place uh, in Johannesburg, though, uh, surrounded by uh, some of our leaders in business, in the public sector, in politics, across the color, political, Line Ziziko Adwa uh, representing, amongst other uh, leaders of the <laughs> ANC, my younger brother from Limpopo, uh, uh, Juju Malema, uh, Makwabo Floyd Shibambu. Uh, actually, this, the EFF is overrepresented here. Godrich, <laughs> uh, the SGs of SGs. Uh, Godrich, Gwere said I must tell you that he didn't run away. He has some commitment in the US. He wanted to come through. All right. Uh, the, the chair of the EFF. Um, where's, where's Solim Simang? Herman Mashaba sends his apology. Moses is traveling. Um, uh, Sipo is, uh, is, um, is your friend here. Holomisa, I haven't seen him. I can't see in the dark. Um, but uh, our union leaders, uh, leaders in government, uh, comrades, brothers and sisters, once again, thank you so much for attending the inaugural chairman's conversation. Please give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> Uh, our guest of honor, you know, time flies when you're having fun. I, I, I can't believe we chowed an hour like that. And, and I have a lot to cover, but let's get on to it. Mm -hmm. Mr. President, you, um, somebody says no good deeds should go unpunished. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, I, I want us to talk about trust and friendship. Then I want us to talk about... Um, um, betrayal. I want us to talk about forgiveness. Mm. Um, at some stage, as the President of the Republic, you had what seemed to be like a very good relationship with, uh, say, someone like a Tony Blair. Um, surprising to us, you seem to somehow get along with, with George Bush. Um, um, and a whole lot of other Western leaders. But, and of course, I mean, your relationship with uh, Botafliga, Algeria, with uh, Obasanjo, whom you, did you meet Obasanjo, by the way, in 77 when you, when you deployed to, to, yes. to Nigeria by the ANC? Yes. Shem, Mam Zanel, I understand, I'm going to run around a bit, this man marries, you guys get married in 1974, and then the following you, he kind of, leaves you and goes to Switzerland. And, and as if that's not enough, um, 75, Switzerland, and then they catch him, and then they throw him. Somehow you manage to negotiate your way to, to Mozambique. Uh, we're thinking you're going to settle and chill around Southern Africa. Then you get sent to Nigeria, um, what, 77? and to dance to a lot of uh, some fella Kuti music while working there. Um, and, and, and then 80, I think, and that's where I wanted to go, 1980 or so, uh, when the, the Zimbabweans uh, started to run their story, especially with Mugabe, you are sent to Zim, you are based there for quite a while. So a very close relationship, obviously, with, with Zim, uh, with uh, Comrade Mugabe and other people. Um, here is Zimbabwe, it's on fire. Here is uh, your friends in the UK, or on the other side, smiling, but also pushing, obviously, for regime change. You are already pushing Nepal and African Renaissance, good governance, responsible governance, looking after our people, etc. You're making commitments on behalf of the continent. You don't want to be the guy putting a gun on Mugabe at the time as a leader because you don't believe in regime change driven from the outside. Somehow you explain your approach to people like Bush and, um, and Tony Blair, and at face really, it looks like they kind of understand. Uh, but as Sister has told, um, some of your friends, um, you're in the middle. And a lot of Zimbabweans, those who are in South Africa and back at home, also felt betrayed by you that you didn't mm -hmm. push Mugabe enough. Um, and as it is, people can't go home, and you said, no, we've got this, we've got this. But Mugabe is still in charge today today. And it's not 75. <laughs> 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 
No, to start off, uh, the, uh, given where you started, mm. um, you know, if you, you, are, you are president of South Africa, uh, one of the things, obviously, that you've got to do is to do whatever is necessary that serves the interests of the country. A part of what that means is that you've got to establish good relations with the rest of the world. Uh, therefore, these various governments around the world. Mm -hmm. And that's what normally I think uh, any president of, uh, of a state would do. <clears throat> so we would have a, a good relations with Blair and Bush and uh, Hu Jintao in China and uh, uh, Manwan Singh in India and, you know, whoever. Uh, Lula in, in, in Brazil, uh, Fidel Castro in Cuba, um, uh, Brother Leader. Brother Leader. Muammar Gaddafi. May his soul rest in peace. May indeed his soul rest in peace. So, but I'm saying that is the task. That doesn't mean we agree with the things that they do. I'll give you just two small examples. Mm. A Bush, mm. a President George Bush, he calls me uh, something like four weeks before they invaded Iraq in 2003. Mm. Uh, he calls and he says to me that, look, uh, as you can see from the media, this thing is coming. I would rather not go to war against Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, because I really don't want to be this person who goes around to the families in America to say your daughter has died, your son has died in the war in Iraq. I don't want it. And one of the things it's going to do is that it's going to generate very strong, a very strong anti-American sentiment, sentiment globally. Mm. So I say I agree with you, President. It will generate that, which already exists. It will get worse. Uh, you don't want that. <laughs> Neither do I. Mm. And indeed, I don't think you should invade Iraq. So he says to me, uh, if only I can be assured that Saddam does not have weapons of mass destruction. Right. If, if only I can receive a signal that Saddam does not have weapons of mass destruction. So, uh, <clears throat> so I say to him, President, we, we sent our people, South Africans, to Iraq mm. to look into that weapons of mass direction, uh, destruction. Mm. They prepared a report he submitted it to the Secretary General of the UN and UN Security Council. Get hold of your people in New York. Mm. He says he didn't know about that. So mm. I say, get hold of your people in New York to give you that report. That report will tell you that Saddam does not have weapons of mass destruction. He says, okay, I'll do that. Why is he going to listen to a report generated in, by you, by South Africa? And then I send a message to uh, uh, Tony Blair and said to him, uh, look, I've, uh, Bush phoned me and said he's looking for a signal that Saddam doesn't have these weapons. But I told him about the documents at the UN, but can you ask him specifically what would this signal be? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> because I said to Tony Blair, because we can get it. Because we're in good contact with Saddam, we, we can get him to send that signal because as South Africa, we are convinced there are no such weapons of mass destruction. Mm. I was told by some British friends that Tony Blair did not send that message to Bush. Mm. Why, I don't know. <clears throat> mm. But I'm saying that, uh, mm. sure, we maintain good mm. friendship with these people, but we didn't agree with them. Mm. I'm citing the instance mm. of... Mm. Uh, mm. Of, of the Libya, of the, how, how of the did, Gulf War. How did, how, how did uh, give us just a quick sample for my brothers from across the river, from Zim. This is for you, my brothers. One of the questions. In a nutshell, because of the struggle history and because Mugabe is an elder, did you protect him at all costs against the interests of the people of Zim? No, I'm sure that uh, President Mugabe has every possibility to protect himself. Didn't need our help. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sure he didn't need our help. No, what, what, what happened was that we, uh, 
as we saw that the situation in Zimbabwe was getting more difficult, in fact, the first people to approach us mm. to say, please do something, were the MDC, Chiang Rai, mm. who said, uh, look, can you please do something? What the first thing they asked us was an, an amendment to the Constitution. Uh, let this be amended like this and that and the other, these particular sections. Can you please intervene? I remember that uh, because immediately after they raised this thing with us, we said, all right, we'll do that. Uh, I had to meet uh, uh, President Mugabe at the Ansmats Airport mm -hmm. before it became oh, our town. Yeah. Yeah. He was passing through going to uh, Malaysia or Indonesia or somewhere there. So I had to see him at the airport. He likes going to Malaysia, yeah. brother. Hmm? He likes going to Malaysia. <coughs> and said to him, President, the MDC have approached us. Da, 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 da. So that was our first political engagement relating to the two. Yes. In the end, uh, we, Trevor will remember this, um, we actually prepared uh, a 30, 40 page critique mm -hmm. of what was happening in Zimbabwe what was politically going wrong politically, what was going wrong economically, what was wrong going on in every respect, and sent it to ZANU-PF. And the reason we did the document was to prepare for a meeting between the ANC and ZANU-PF. Because mm -hmm. ZANU-PF wanted to say, the ANC wanted to say to ZANU-PF, you are doing wrong things. Mm -hmm. That document fortunately got leaked. Um, I don't know how they got it, but, but it was leaked by the Mail and Guardian. So it's in the public domain. Right. Okay. So anybody can read it and see what the ANC was saying to President Mugabe and the others. Right. That you are doing wrong things in the politics, in the economy, in this and that and the other. So this thing must change like this and the other way. So that was the stance of the ANC. That was our interaction with right. it. But in the context of resolving the conflict there, the view we took then, which I would still hold on to that, it's, it really is a responsibility of the people of Zimbabwe to determine their future. It's a responsibility of people of South Africa to determine our future. But people will say, <coughs> people will say, people will say, how convenient, Mr. President, when you were in trouble, we came all out to help. Why not a little more forceful? That's what they will say. No, you see, we're talking about, they talk about mm. things which are in, not not cannot be compared. Mm -hmm. And apartheid South Africa is, re is very different from independence of Mabu. Mm -hmm. And you say you want to impose uh, sanctions against apartheid, of course you can. Of course you must. But to s resolve a problem among the Zimbabweans in independent Zimbabwe, our view was and remains, let the people of Zimbabwe get together and sort out this thing among themselves. Particularly because given, among other things, mm -hmm. you know, my, all my experience tells me that an external solution to a domestic problem like that, an external so a solution that gets imposed on the people, when something goes wrong, the locals will not take ownership of it. They will say this thing after all came from given, it's not ours. Mm -hmm. To make an agreement stick and, and so on, you get the, get the owners of the problem to own the solution. And that's what we said with Zimbabweans. So in the end, they enter into negotiations which we facilitate. In 2008, they uh, 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 conclude what was called a global political mm. agreement. Mm. I saw Advocate Gumbi here during the break. Mm. She uh, was very she's central. Very, in she's the, chilling with the, with the, EFF. the new face of what? <laughs> <laughs> now, Advocate Gumbi, who is, uh, as most of us would know, comes from a black consciousness movement and background, is chilling with the face of white monopoly capital, Maria Ramos. <laughs> <laughs> so, that global political agreement, which covered a whole range of all these problems that the Zimbabweans were having, including a, a, a vision about where Zimbabwe mm -hmm. should go, mm -hmm was negotiated by the Zimbabweans. Right. The MDC, Chiang Rai, MDC, Mtambara, ZANU-PF, which had the thing. But it was their document. We insisted, uh-uh, 
We are not going to sit in Pretoria and draft a document for you people. Mm. You sit there, Zimbabweans, and say, what do you do about your own country? Mm. It's their document, <coughs> the GPA. We assisted them, and this and that and the other. The problem we had, the reason you had this funny uh, argument that we resorted to quiet diplomacy. Mm -hmm. As if diplomacy is ever quite loud. This is my, why I'm saying it's funny, because mm. uh, diplomacy is diplomacy. It's not... Uh, it's not pronounced. Uh, now, once you campaign on the platform, that's no longer diplomacy. <laughs> <laughs> that's a political campaign. But the reason, for instance, the British joined that chorus is because they wanted regime change. Why, what was in their interest? Why, why, were they, why so much interest in Zim? in particular, by the West. You know, you had, uh, you had four countries on the continent which had uh, big, white, European settler populations. That was South Africa, Algeria, Kenya, and Zimbabwe. Uh, you have still had a significant uh, number of uh, um, white people in Zimbabwe after independence. Uh, part of the argument used by Margaret Thatcher when she was against imposition of sanctions mm -hmm. against the Smith regime was that uh, we have a lot of kith and kin in Zimbabwe. Mm. If we impose sanctions which actually work, mm -hmm you will then get half a million Zimbabweans or a quarter of a million or whatever emigrating to England. Mm. They're kith and kin. Mm. And sadly, we'll be landed with a large refugee population mm. here coming from Zimbabwe. Mm. This was my Margaret Thatcher's argument. Mm. And we don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that's why we don't want to impose sanctions. It was the same argument uh, when uh, Smith declared that UDI in 1985. Prime Minister of the UK at the time, 65. Mm -hmm. uh, Prime Minister of the UK at the time was uh, Harold Wilson, mm -hmm. Labour Party. And again, the Africans it took the position that this was a rebellion against the Crown, against the British Crown. Mm -hmm. And wherever you've had a rebellion against the British Crown, the British Crown has responded in order to suppress rebellion. Hmm. Let that happen in Zimbabwe. And the argument of the British government, at the time I was in England, Sam Zanilla was in the UK at the time, we campaigned about this, was this is kith and kin. So you're not surprised when the UK continues to pay this particular attention to Zimbabwe, hmm. They are paying attention to, the attention to Zimbabwe, not because they're interested in the future of Zimbabwe, but because they're interested in the welfare of the kith and kin. That's what drove the <coughs> British policy in Zimbabwe. But, but, but surely, surely it wouldn't have helped with that understanding that um, the leadership, Comrade Mugabe, the leadership at ZANU-PF, um, with certain commitments that they would have made, and Tangara as well, uh, they were not helping your cause in many respects. I mean, the truth is that Zim is not where it should be. Would you agree? Sure, it's not. <clears throat> it's not. That's why I'm saying that. And, it, and so sometimes your own people can embarrass you when you're making a commendable argument out there. If the behavior is to the contrary, sometimes it does help the cause of, uh, for lack of better, the enemy. Sure. I mean, the, the, uh, the, if you look at the global political agreement given, the GPA, mm. The agreements into which the Zimbabweans entered about what do we do with the governance, governance of the country, what do we do with the politics of the country, what do we do with the economy, what do we do with the land, what do we do with all of this. It's a very, very good, correct policies. But they fail to implement. Talk about fail to implement, I'm mindful of time. You are on Power 98.7, Capricorn FM, and live on ENCA. This is the Chairman's conversation with uh, President Tawimbeki. Thank you so much for paying attention, for listening, and for joining us. Mr. President, did you compromise hundreds of thousands of people in order to save money of the state of government and were heartless enough to let 
black people die of AIDS and you did not give a didn't care <laughs> no Gavin we, for, unfortunately we don't have time to no, discuss this thing properly yeah. but the, the, the policy the, 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 the current government yeah. uh, one of the things I hear they, they, they praise themselves for is uh, <clears throat> is a very good, effective AIDS policy. Mm -hmm. That policy was adopted by our government in the early 2000s mm -hmm. and hasn't changed. Uh, we, did, we adopted that policy, uh, uh, Trevor, you might remember, and Mujang, 2000, 2001, thereabouts. Uh, comprehensive Afri mm -hmm. policy on AIDS, da 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 da. Mm -hmm. uh, and it hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. So the then government acted on this issue. So anybody who argues that we didn't is wrong. I say you're forced, you didn't want to. No, nonsense. Uh, <coughs> uh, <laughs> uh, nonsense, you know, we, uh, there was an issue that was raised in the, uh, uh, in the literature that uh, the, some of these uh, AIDS drugs had a very high toxic effect. And so we said, I said publicly, that therefore we must uh, look at this matter because it may be that it is the drug that kills people rather than the illness because of the toxicity. So let, let, let's look at this matter. Uh, and, and act on it. <clears throat> As it happened with that particular drug which was, uh, which was mentioned then, mm -hmm. in fact, they actually reduced the dosages never globally. Been? Never mind which one. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> they actually reduced the dosages because the allegation that it was highly toxic was mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. So there are many other questions that we raised. You see the... That's why I was saying we don't have enough time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, let's, let's try it. Boom, in a nutshell, on, on that question. I don't know about that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, AIDS, the acronym AIDS is Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Mm -hmm. That's AIDS. So the question we're asking, what causes immune deficiency? And how is this thing acquired which causes immune deficiency? Because in our response to this condition, mm -hmm. we must be able to do everything possible to deal with this problem of acquired immune deficiency. It was exactly to make sure that we save lives of our people, mm -hmm. not the opposite. But then people say, uh -uh, the only thing that you do with regard to acquired immune deficiency, give them ARVs. And I say, you can't say that. Because uh, given medical textbooks that are used in our medical schools here, they'll have a chapter there on acquired immune deficiency. And they tell you how immune deficiency is acquired. Persistent malnutrition, uh, malaria which is not treated properly, venereal diseases which are not treated properly, these are the things which, some of the things which result in acquired immune deficiency, mm -hmm. which produce this syndrome. Mm -hmm. As a government, <clears throat> you got to say, therefore, let us intervene to make sure people don't suffer from malnutrition, to make sure that diseases are treated properly. You are dealing with the problem of acquired immune deficiency. No, the problem was, no, no, don't do any of those things. Give them ARVs. What, 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 inform, what in your view, why, why that insistence? Don't ask questions, give why, 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 where, where did that come from? I suppose people got convinced by whatever was said publicly that the only solution to this problem is this one. Uh, you need a comprehensive response to this, including ARVs. 
But to say the only way to deal with immune deficiency, if not, let me go back a bit. You got the virus HI, the human immune deficiency virus, which is part of the complex of this. And so part of what we were saying, but what I was saying, is that true? I, I, I agree that HIV might be part of what causes immune deficiency, but it's not the only thing. I'm saying I'll give you a medical textbook tomorrow, mm. uh, written by Kuvadia and others, which explains this thing. Uh, so I'm saying that uh, yeah. what we had to do, what I was arguing, as a as a government, you need a comprehensive uh, uh, intervention on this, which is why the issue of poverty arose. Because your immune deficiency, a lot of your diseases which will cause acquired immune deficiency are diseases of poverty. You've got to deal with that. This is a socioeconomic problem, not just a medical problem. Intervene medically, sure. But you've got to also intervene in this other way. The people who manufacture the drugs are not interested in your socioeconomic interventions. They make money out of sale of drugs. <clears throat> well, so they'll push drugs. Well, um, so we spoke briefly about Zim, briefly about HIV. As you are pushing back in Zim, at least as you believed, as you are wanting to engage in a comprehensive, hopefully sustainable solution to a problem. By the, at the time, Sub-Saharan Africa, the numbers as well on HIV were just getting crazy. As you're doing that, you are making some very strong friends, very, very strong friends out there. Some of the Western powers are not happy with what's happening on the continent in that the union, the consolidation that's happening there. Uh, you've already provoked pharmaceutical companies. Britain and other people with a high concentration of a massive white population in the UK, in, 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 in Zim, there's a particular interest. So you've just acquired at least, if your perspective is to be followed, you now acquired in my, in my account about three or four enemies. Well, as if that's not enough, back with your 96 project, you've also acquired enemies at home. You are almost nearing the end of your term, in terms of government at least. So... Comrades are starting to say, so, so what's next, right? So, with that summary, external challenges, internal new friends, or at least those that you believe your friends, and then before you know it, man, you are down. May we, may we make it down, gone. <coughs> and, and, it's done so well that uh, there's an embarrassing element that seven months before you, you are going to end your term, or so you, they beat you in Puluqua and they find that's, that's democracy of the ANC, whatever reasons, whatever the, the consideration comes easy. So they, round one down in Puluqua, seven months before to go, to go over, no, 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 actually take him out now, right? And most of these are your comrades. These are your friends, guys who grew up, some of your best friends. Your fellow brothers <laughs> um, took you down. And so somebody could argue that there's a convergence of those external factors. Already you have Mr. AIDS denialist, protecting Mugabe, right? Neoliberal, whatever, whatever. Um, how do you relate to yourself, beyond work, beyond the politics, how does this affect you personally when people that you grew up with, some of whom you recruited to the movement, some of whom you actually taught how to engage in a modern state, the economist, the reader that you are. And, bro, they, they go for you, they, boom. <laughs> how, how, how does that sit? <laughs> Um, can I answer this question? You may. In a way I want to answer Yes, it. sir, please. Okay. <laughs> you know, we, uh, the, according to ANC constitution, uh, the president of the ANC must present a political report yes. 
at this elective conference, mm. while well, it's actually at all the other conferences. So uh, we go to Pologwan in 2007, and uh, I prepared the political report and presented it. And for the first time, uh, it's not discussed. So naturally, some of the delegations there in the conference, they said, no, but uh, when are we going to discuss the political report? Because the report to conference, which conference must uh, discuss and criticize and what da, da, da. No, 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 it will not be discussed. And wasn't discussed. I, I understood why. Because you, you must have seen given the, the report, with this, what is called the Diagnostic Report mm -hmm. by the current Secretary General of the ANC, Gwede Mandash, yes. which is submitted now at the policy conference. We raised those issues in the political report in 97. Mm. <laughs> careful, and, and said, careful, somebody might suggest that you wrote your Gwede. greatest report. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. We raise these things and say, here are the problems that are facing the ANC, including an issue which Gwede doesn't raise, which is the habit of telling lies. I was saying that, you see, there's a crept into the practices of the ANC, something which is very, very foreign to the ANC, the use of lies to achieve particular objectives. Uh, uh, Juju is here. <coughs> yeah. uh, Juju can tell you about why that report was not discussed. So I'm raising these things that to say, uh, uh, you know, in the end I say, at least one of the things I say there, is that uh, in 2012, we are going to be celebrating the centenary of the ANC. Mm -hmm. We must be very careful that we are not the only people as members of the ANC who celebrate that centenary and the rest of the country stay, stays away because of our misbehavior. Mm. It's in that report, 2007. They didn't want to discuss it because a lot, Juju will repeat this after me, <clears throat> a lot of what happened at that conference in December, in 2007, mm. was based on lies. Lies were told to Juju here. Mm by people whom Juju had no reason to disbelieve. So quite correctly, he believed them. And he was much younger. And he was much younger and acted accordingly. He discovers much later that he was lied to. <laughs> so what... what What, I, what I'm saying, given, is that mm -hmm. I, I, I raise this thing about the, the use of lies. Mm -hmm. I put it like that. Mm -hmm. The use of lies in order to achieve particular objectives. So you get all sorts of stories told about the political balance of forces in the ANC, da, 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 which produces outcome and so on. People don't discuss the practicality of what happened mm -hmm. with made. Julius Malema behave in the way he did. Therefore, 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 to come to the yes. answer the question that you are asking. Yes. No, no, I actually was going to derail you to go, but I see you with some of, some of, so Juju came out publicly and said, I was lied to, I'm sorry. Vavi did the same. I saw that um, your SG at the time, Mutland, um, after he got out of office, actually just while he was in office, I would see you guys publicly together. Um, and it seems that somehow you seem to get on well. Your report was not tabled. 
The SG's report was not kind to you. Halima's report in Bulwana was not kind to you. I wanted to proceed, <laughs> um, having, having, yeah. You are right. <clears throat> but Kalima's report was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it was quite wrong. Unfortunately for him, it was also not discussed. Uh, <clears throat> but it was quite wrong. It was, uh, uh, I've, I've never discussed it with him since. Uh, that's why I don't want to discuss it on Power FM. Mm -hmm. But it, it, the report was wrong. Um, um, but I'm, so I was saying to come back to answer the question you posed. Mm. So when I see all of these negative things happening, and, and including many other comrades, I'm not the only one who sees this thing, mm. we see all of these wrong things happening. It's not so much what, what we feel individually, personally, uh, but it's the sense you get that we are facing a major, major challenge. Mr. President, I'm, I'm gonna, yeah. I want to stop there before we proceed. Um, yes, it's the chairman's conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I want us to, the people of this country love you. They love you. People of this country love Tabo Miki. Not just the former president, Tabo Miki. Back time, about right. They, some of them worry, how are you? And I, I want us to say, when you experience what could be betrayal from people that you would have traveled such a long journey through a very difficult journey of our own country, and those people, for whatever reasons, turn against you and treat you the way they did and embarrass you in front of your people, in front of your colleagues on the continent having preached good governance on the continent and, and, and. I want to know, Mr. President, how does that make you feel? Have you forgiven, recovered? Has it made sense, has it sunk in, that actually you may have been betrayed by people you trusted the most? <laughs> you see, that's why I was given, I was saying, I must answer this question of yours in the way that I want to answer it. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> Do not help him to dive. <laughs> yes, sir. You see, really what, what, what worries us greatly, mm. and I'm sure continues to worry us to this day, mm. was that what we were seeing uh, in Puluwane, and we're, this reason we're criticizing it in a formal policy report to the ANC conference, mm. was because we could see that these things are going to result, lead to the destruction of the ANC. If not arrested, they were going to lead to the destruction of the ANC. Mm. These, these matters are being raised today with the same concern. In a situation which I'm quite certain has gone worse. So the principal issue is not uh, how does Tabombegi feel when he's about to go to bed. The principal question is uh, how does this person feel as part of this movement? Because it's, it's also given this thing, as you know very well. Mm. This thing is not just about the ANC as an organization because we are comrades and friends and all that. But it's about the future of the country. This is a governing party, which has uh, whatever. <clears throat> and therefore, the things it does or doesn't do impact on the future of the country. So I'm saying that we get worried then, 2007, mm. to say uh -uh, we have to do something about this. And part of the tragedy, part of the tragedy of Pulugwan, which incidentally President Zuma spoke about it just now when he closed the ANC policy conference. He, he say, gives a figure, uh, which may be correct. Uh, <clears throat> uh, No, he says, uh, he says at Pulugwane, he slayed one with 60% of the votes, mm. and uh, the losing ones, us, 40%. And then he says, but you see, the mistake that was made 
is that because this wealth, the 40% opposition to us, we allowed a lot of good comrades to leave. Mm -hmm. And it's right. Mm -hmm. It's right among that 40% were exactly the people that you need who were driven not by wanting to enrich themselves, mm -hmm. who were driven exactly by this thing. We serve the people of South Africa. The ANC lost a lot of them in Puluwa. Mm. And the country lost a lot of them because of that. Can the ANC recover them? Uh, if the ANC, the Juju, they recover them. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Julia says no. And he says, Julia says no. Julius. Uh, can I get a mic to Julius? <laughs> that was very... <clears throat> uh, Juju, I want you to ask the president a question. And the question that I wish for you to ask him <laughs> is to give him tips on what you believe his organization will have to do to recover its moral standing, that 40% that it lost, what, 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 what would the AC need to do? What would it need to do? Can, can you give him some tips? <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, Mr. President. Uh, I, um, I think the first thing I want to acknowledge is that the president was right when he said we're misled. Mm. And one of the misleading and one of the misleading things which I was telling Zizi now was we were told that uh, the president, if he goes back to office, he will amend the constitution of the Republic of South Africa so that he stays forever in power in South Africa. The second one was that he's concocting charges against President Zuma. And that President Zuma is not corrupt, he's an honorable man, and therefore he is uh, fighting against President Zuma because he's got his own ideas on how the ANC must go forward. And thanks God, we lived to see for ourselves that no one was actually concocting charges against Zuma. Zuma was corrupt himself. And uh, even when they left the office, the people who were, who were you know, concocting charges against him. He still got new accusations in the absence of those who were alleged to be concocting charges <laughs> against him. So, 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 so we have realized much more later that we are actually misled. The question which, yes. Mr. President, you need to deal with mm -hmm. is the issue of corruption. You can say all good things here. The reality of the situation is that we are counted amongst the most highly corrupt countries. Yet there is no high profile or a political figure, including a business figure, who has been successfully jailed for corruption. It happened under you, one of them was Tony Engeni, and then later on there was Jagis Levy and all that. Corruption is very high in South Africa today, but there's no single individual who has been jailed for so, that. So, so Mago, and, and which means yeah. that corruption is being glorified and being celebrated. Mm. And as a result, that is driving a lot of people away from uh, what used to be a glorious movement. So uh, if you deal with that, Mr. President, I think your organization will regain a lot of strength. The second issue you need to deal with is the issue of the land. We shouldn't shy away from it. The land is in the hands of the minorities, and we know, and you know that history better than me. And we have agreed that willing buyer, willing seller is not working. Mr. President, the policy of willing buyer, willing seller, which you adopted, it was going to be good if our people had money, they will buy. But even when our people have money, Mr. President, and there is no willing seller, they won't buy. Because there must be a willing seller 
uh, to be the willing buyer. So you don't have the money, you cannot buy. Okay. Even when you have the money, there is no willing seller. Therefore, the land remains in the hands of the minorities. So we need a much a more genuine radical program you can see to redistribute you can the land. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, so um, I need guidance on news, ne? right? Because I, I really want to give the president time to respond properly. I should continue. Am I good? Excellent. Well done, team. Mr. President, um, corruption, we can't debate that. But I think Juju raises a matter that I want us to attend to another broader concept, context of the economy, land, right? And I want to go, that, go there by earlier on the 75-year-old man spoke. We have an economist amongst in our midst, ladies and gentlemen. Master of Economics, um, President Big. Technical recession. Downgrades after downgrades. In your birthday message, you say the center, it is clear that the center doesn't hold, that we are not in a good space in the world, on the continent, but in South Africa, it's, it's there for everyone to see. Let's go to the land question and we'll address quite a few things around your own view around the policies that you led. The ANC. The, uh, yes. Uh, yes. Juju is correct. Yes. Uh, we have to discuss very seriously. Yes. The, uh, the land question. Yes, sir. The EFF has come to certain conclusions about the land question, which is stated. Right. I would start somewhere else. I would say let's discuss it seriously. Please. For instance, uh, what the Freedom Charter says, and again, Julius will know this, it says the land shall be shared among those who work it. Why, why was it phrased like that? I don't work the land. I live here in Johannesburg. <laughs> <laughs> it says the land shall be shared among those who work it. Yeah. If you said to the ANC, go back to the Freedom Charter and act according to what the Freedom Charter says, mm -hmm. it would say, not what Julius has just said, mm -hmm. it would say, okay, we therefore need to make sure that the land is shared among those who work it. Who works the land? Mm. Is it farm workers, the farm owners, and the people in the rural areas? Um, including where there's this communal land. These are the people who work the land, according to Freedom Chat. What do we do about that? <clears throat> it's not the answer, uh, Julius, if I understood you correctly, mm -hmm. that's not the answer that the EFF is looking for. Mm -hmm. It's looking for something else. Or it could add that those who... Therefore, that's why mm -hmm. I'm saying... Uh, Who's in charge here? <laughs> Therefore, that's why I'm saying that uh, Juju, I, my, my, my uh, view is that where I would like to start mm. is a very serious discussion about this issue, the, about the land, uh, land question. Mm -hmm. There is a, a very urgent issue that we need to deal with, which is urban land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, <clears throat> and indeed, there is nothing in the law or in the constitution or anywhere which would uh, uh, prohibit a government mm -hmm. from expropriating land, urban land, for urban settlement, for human settlement. None. So, and you see the squatter camps growing up all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, and these land problems arise and people get evicted and so on. But it's clear that we've got need for urban land and so why does the government take the land? Why didn't your government take the land? Indeed, you may very well ask that question, why didn't we take the land? Again, you come back to the quite issue that Julius was raising. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to avoid a discussion on this because it's bound to be very limited. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, as Julius was saying, we, took, uh, we adopted this principle of willing buy and willing sell. Incidentally, I must say, it's not in the Constitution. Mm. It's not a constitutional imperative. I hear people saying, amend the Constitution, I don't know what for. Uh, 
because it doesn't, uh, the Constitution, even in terms of, uh, except to the extent of, the, it talks about expropriation without compensation, which the Constitution would be against. Uh, but I'm saying that because we took that position. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, it was related to, is related to many things, given you are trying to mislead us into discussing something we shouldn't. Uh, South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white. Freedom Charter, Constitution. Consequence, let's try and uh, 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 treat with the matter of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. We've got to reconcile these different sections of the South African population to make sure that South Africa does indeed belong to all only to the black and white. That's got various implications, that observation. Yes. One of them being, then how do, yes indeed there is a problem of the land, land uh, inequality, inequity, the land dispossession, etc. matter must be dealt with. How do we deal with it in the context of this? notion, mm -hmm. the kind of South Africa we want to build which belongs to all who live in it, black and white, united in our diversity. It's got certain policy implications in terms of what you do. That's why I'm saying that I'd, rather, I'd, I'd want us to discuss this question, including this phenomenon, uh, and maybe the EFF has answered it. You have the, uh, the land restitution process, and people win the claims, they make claims, and they win uh, the land. And then when they are told, okay, yeah, your claim has succeeded, they say, I'd rather take the money. Mm. I'd, I'd like you just to explain to me, why, why is that? Mm -hmm. Why are our people not taking the land? There are other complications. I don't know where... Uh, Advocate Gumbi, if I can say this. Um, She's nodding. She says you can. Archbishop, Arch, Archbishop Makoma mm. uh, has written uh, his autobiography. Um, I, maybe I shouldn't have said this, but never mind. Uh, <laughs> and it raises a very important question. Mm -hmm. In the, in the very first chapter, raise a very, very important question about land. Mm -hmm. And it says the Makoba people who come from what is called Makoba's Kloof, mm -hmm. uh, their land got taken by force in the 19th century. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when we decided on the period during which uh, you could reclaim land, we said from 1913 onwards. So he says, therefore, they didn't have this possibility to reclaim land. Mm. Um, mm. But it was still, some other piece of land was taken after 1913. Then it was possible to claim that piece of land, mm. and they succeeded to Makovas. Yes. And then he says, the problem is that the Makovas then started fighting among themselves. Mm over this piece of land. Mm. So much that they, the Archbishop and his immediate family, they pulled out. They mm. said, no, we leave this. Mm. Mm. That's not unique, mm. that phenomenon. So let us, let's discuss this question properly in detail without the slogans. I know, Juju, you've got to win support and then all that. <laughs> I, do, I don't have to. Uh, <clears throat> Let's deal with the question. I agree entirely, mm. absolutely entirely, with the land Excellent. question. But let's, let's deal with it properly. Uh, Excellent. But, 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 uh, but certainly the heightened focus on land with regard to the majority, you will definitely agree is it's long overdue. Oh, uh, absolutely. Mm. Yes. Mm. The only thing I'm pleading for is that let us discuss this matter seriously. And soberly. Uh, soberly, yes. You know, like... Uh, <clears throat> You know, my mother, uh, my mother stayed in a village there, in the Trans Sky, uh, overlooking the immediate villages, huge tracts of fallow land. And I was asking her, I was saying, but why is this land lying fallow? Mm. It's not, it's fallow, absolutely fallow. She explained to me 
that uh, one of the reasons is uh, before, it says, when you grew up, the, these families owned a lot of cattle. So I said, yes, they did. They no longer, need, they grow, they no longer have those heads of cattle. So now they need a tractor mm. to come and plow this thing. They don't have money to buy a tractor, neither do they have money to hire a tractor. Mm. So I said, okay, I see that. Then she says, then what's happened when you grew up there were heads boys who looked after this cattle so that the cattle would not wander into the fields and eat up all of this maize. Mm. I said, yeah, that's, that's right. Mm. She says all the heads boys are now at school. Mm. So that even if uh, you were able to plow here, mm. there is nobody to chase away the goats because the children are at school. Yeah. So what therefore you need, she says, mm. First of all, you got to these open fields that you're looking at, you got to fence them. Mm. Mm. And these rural people they don't have the money. Number two, you've got to hire a tractor for them so that it can come and plow this thing and so on. She says these are some of the reasons that these lands are lying fallow. Okay. Now, when we therefore discuss the land question, we must get down to that kind of detail. That level of detail. What is it that we do? Uh, what is beyond, it that beyond, we do to... Beyond pronouncements, beyond policy implementation. I want to go to, to calls. Um, um, we have, I asked, I, Mr. President, I chose, I asked the power listeners to nominate who should represent them. <laughs> and they did that, and we chose about 10 callers, and they're in the room. Mm. We'll see foodie and all sorts of... Good evening! But I'm going to take uh, one of our power callers. Where's Navari? I, I'm with Navari here. Uh, JJ. Amen. Yeah. Um, yeah, can we put a spot line? Oh, that's JJ Tawane of Power Perspective. Yes. With one of our regular callers. Navari, thanks for honoring my invitation. Good, good, good evening, uh, President. Good evening. And good evening, uh, Chairman. Good evening, Navari. And the Power fans and listeners. President, the fellow communists are at the Bosbeck. And I, last time I checked, you've chaired the last uh, uh, communist conference in the South African Communist Party conference in Cuba. Four days alone. I doubt that uh, many of us knows that. And I know that you are still a member of the Communist Party, <laughs> not by membership. <laughs> <laughs> President is for socialism, I know. <clears throat> I, I uh, 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 don't want to be confused on form and content. And I know that... Uh, Many of the questions you have been raising, including that of white monopoly capital, and the aspect that relates to how you have, you know, structured government, relates to the question, Floyd, of strategy and tactic, which we might differ on how we approach it, combine all of us in this room, because we're not seeing things uh, similarly. <clears throat> the, the, the aspect that relates to ability of uh, our influence in Africa, the fact that we have at some point arrived at a point Navari, of, Yes. Let's I'm going get, to a question. Let's get to, yeah, let's get to you, my brother. The fact that uh, the, the stability of our economy allow us, the fiscals, to able to dictate policy on our own and able to tell the foreign forces where to get off when necessary in the quest to build the Africa we needed was amongst the key things that many of ourselves felt that as you pursue your dream, of African for Africans. There's an aspect of question of peace and justice. That remain a question that now, will follow the rest of your life. In my time, can you, in, in my time as a, as a broadcaster, can you, can I you please, cut people off. Can you please explain to us in details, including the question of Zimbabwe, by the way, that beside the fact of the things that we have raised, you have actually overlooked the question of peace and justice. And your focus has been more on peace than the pursuit of justice that many of our African people have suffered in the hands of dictators. And you are seen as amongst those who protected many dictators in Africa, including in Gabon, including in Gabon. Okay, Navari. Uh, JJ, please and take, Ivory Coast. take the microphone. Thank you very much. <laughs> See, it's, easy, it's, easy, it's easier with a phone because you can fade him, but he's got the mic. <laughs> Thank you so much, Navari. Uh, and you asked the president to answer in detail 
I will ask him to be very brief. The issue, quite, quite correctly, the, there is this issue that faces us in terms of conflict, in situations of conflict, the relationship between peace and justice. Take our case here, uh, South Africa. We negotiate for an end to apartheid uh, so that all of the negative things that happen to our people because of our apartheid system should come to an end. We must achieve this objective. Then an issue arises, but these people are the ones who killed us in, a, in the prisons and uh, dropped Ahmed Timol uh, from the 10th floor of the, the, the Marshall Square and, and all that. Uh, where is, what about justice? So we say, sure, you can't ignore the issue of justice. But in our instance, let's deal with the justice issue through the TRC. It was because of specific conditions in South Africa at the time. So the issue of justice here was not ignored, but was dealt with in a particular way. Now, you have a, a civil war going on in, 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 in South Sudan. It's been going on since uh, December 2013. President Obasanjo leads a, a, a team mandated by the African Union to investigate human rights violations in South Sudan. And they do that, they prepare the report, and among other things says, it says, on the justice issue, uh, the people who have been directly involved in the killing of other South Sudanese must be charged the justice factor. So there must be an end to the killing to achieve peace. To deal with the justice thing, you must charge those who are responsible for killing people. You know what it means? If you implemented that, it means there would be no peace in South Sudan. Because what it means is you must arrest the current president of South Sudan, and charge him. You must arrest the principal leader of the opposition and charge him. The first question you must answer, who's going to arrest them? <laughs> Mr. President. <laughs> and even if, if, you, if you arrested them, if you arrested them, the, these are the two people you need to make peace. You need them to make peace to say to their fighting forces, stop the fighting, lay down your guns. You need those two. Without them, you're not going to achieve that. Then having laid down the guns, you mm -hmm. say, now you are under arrest. Mm -hmm. It won't happen. You are dealing with a very uh, uh, challenging uh, uh, situation to deal with, uh, uh, as you mentioned, Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire requires a process of national reconciliation. President Bagbo, who is now on trial at The Hague, is critical to the achievement of the process of national reconciliation in Cote d'Ivoire. If you don't have him contributing to the process of national reconciliation, Cote d'Ivoire is going back to civil war. So you might celebrate that justice is served by having Bagbo in The Hague, there will be a civil war in, South, in, South, in Cote d'Ivoire as a consequence yeah. of your victory. Okay. So I'm saying you have to balance these two things in the way we try to balance them here. Mm. To say you must deal with the peace issue, the end of apartheid, but you must deal with the justice thing also. You can't ignore it. But how do you deal with it? Mr. President, so that is the balance, my friend, that you need. I, and, and I know that this, this, this is a very critical, very critical um, question a lot of the work that you're doing on the continent. I, I want us to start wrapping up quickly. I, I was wishing to take more comments, but time is not on our side. You, you, it's very difficult to rush the president because these are gems and you can't take a shortcut approach to some of these questions. So uh, it's unfortunate, but hey, Mr. President, our economy is in trouble. You are an economist. 
What can we do? Short term, what are the low hanging fruits and what do we need to do differently to sustain, to change the course of our, and I'm asking the economist, what do you do? <laughs> you have a, uh, uh, no, no, uh, sorry, I need to call the chairman of the EFF and Juju and, and I know what you answered, don't <laughs> fire people, Juju Manimanyan. I'm asking an economic question, not a political question. What do we do? to sort out this ailing economy, this broken economy of ours. Uh, Trevor led the process uh, given, as you know, mm. uh, which resulted in uh, the adoption of the National Development Plan. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hear many people in the country saying, very good plan, except for Vavi and a few others. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> But let us, let us assume, let us take it that the National Development Plan is generally accepted in the country and so on. Uh, what I've been saying, uh, and Trevor will pardon me for this, is that it's not a plan. It's a vision. It's called a plan. But it's not a plan, it's a vision. Because when you plan, you say, therefore, in terms of what we have to do, we need to build 1,000 trucks this year. Mm -hmm. Who's going to build them? Now you, you build 500, and you 250, da, 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 da. That's a plan. Hmm. Now we need to take the NDP, in terms of reporting your question mm -hmm. about what mm -hmm. needs to be done with the economy, I'm saying starting from this position, that broadly, the South Africans are saying the NDP is okay. All right, let's take that as Democrats. You we don't agree. sound like a fan of the NDP. No, as Democrats, we agree with that. <laughs> so uh, let's then elaborate a plan mm. to achieve these objectives which are spelled out in the NDP. Mm. I think that's what response that we need. Mm. Because I, I, my oh, sense, mm, my sense mm, as of now, mm, mm. it may be very well wrong, mm. may very well be wrong. Mm. Is this God who is here? He may tell me that I'm wrong is that I don't sense that there is any work that is, they claim that, oh, no, 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 the various government departments are doing what they can to implement this. You had the Minister of Finance today making a speech about what needs to be done to deal with it, to answer your question. Yes. And I was surprised that it's the Minister of Finance who's going to elaborate a plan about how to regenerate this economy. It's nothing to do with the Minister of Finance. I would have expected the Ministry of Economic Affairs, mm -hmm. Minister of Trade and Industry, those ones, mm -hmm. to say, therefore, we must invest like this, and la, 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 la. Uh, and of course, the Minister of Finance didn't deal with those questions, because mm. it's not his job. Mm. So let's, let's elaborate a plan of implementation out of the NDP, <laughs> and that might get us somewhere. Do they, do they ever call you for advice or help? No, they wouldn't uh, give it. I mean, they told me in 19, 2008 that I was useless and I was not wanted. <laughs> I, I don't think they've changed their minds. <laughs> do the ministers quietly say, hey, chief, I've been given a job. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. Aung Shevelenji, just whisper to me, what would you do? Do some of them call? Quietly? No, when, when some of them speak to me, they say, Chief, you don't know how difficult it is. <laughs> <laughs> I tell them that I know. <laughs> I tell them that I know. <laughs> or do you, do, you not, do you just say I know or do you say I saw it coming? No, 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 no. I, I, I'm, I just said that term, but I know. I mean, you can see it. It's, you know, it's obvious. It's obvious. I mean. So that was government. What should Zizi, as you go back to the office, 
as it goes back to the office on Friday, or to, I'll have a drink with him tonight, so he won't go tomorrow. On Monday, <laughs> when he goes back to the office, what are the things that Zizi should go and tell his fellow NEC members? Um, oh, shh. Would you tell his NEC members, fellow NEC members? No, but Zizi was here listening. He said all of the things that we've said. <laughs> you know, I was... Uh, <clears throat> um, when asking about ministers, um, the a cabinet, the cabinet agenda was, I don't know now, I was basically made up of a cabinet memoranda submitted by the various ministers who want decisions in terms of the work that they do. So you might have a dozen a cabinet memoranda which serve in a particular cabinet meeting. What, uh, and the cabinet is chaired essentially by the president, who is head of government, not only head of state, but also head of government. So what that requires <clears throat> is that the ministers who submit this cabinet memoranda must prepare themselves properly to present this cabinet <laughs> memoranda. Because the other colleagues on the cabinet are going to raise questions. They are going to debate this cabinet memorandum. Minister of Finance, we don't agree with you. Like this and that and that. In the end, the matter is agreed. What is then is presented to parliament by some minister is actually cabinet policy. It's not departmental. Hmm. Now, so I'm saying the minister, each of the ministers must understand properly what is in the cabinet to be able in the cabinet memorandum to defend it what the chair of the cabinet must do is to understand all ten <laughs> <clears throat> you see you've got to understand as chair of the cabinet you've got to understand all ten cabinet memoranda that are the agenda for this particular meeting so because the issue is raised is debated and you are saying, okay, but somebody raise their hands, all right, you, you, but... And then in the end you will say, but <clears throat> it seems to me that part of what is being suggested in this cabinet memorandum contradicts another decision that we took two months ago. So how do we reconcile these two? So now you must be able as chair mm -hmm. to deal with all ten cabinet memoranda. Otherwise, you don't have a government. <laughs> because then you don't have a center that can hold. So that uh, what, in, what you come out with is a government cabinet decision. If you don't do that, it then becomes individual ministerial decisions. So instead of having a cabinet, you will have what I once called a federation of ministries. <laughs> and Trevor here corrected me and said, no, President, a confederation of <laughs> ministries. <laughs> the... Now, I'm saying that's a problem. Yes. So, uh, if it was Zizi wanted to, to, see, to, Zizi to do some work, mm. he needs to work on that uh, so that you have... Uh, the necessary cohesion uh, in government because the country is facing too many challenges uh, for the government not to be able to act as a cohesive force, which is why you get these ministers of ours saying contradictory things. A minister of uh, home affairs will say, I'm imposing these visas. And the minister of tourism says, what the hell is wrong with you? And hey. <laughs> Both decisions should have come from the cabinet, but clearly didn't. Because I'm saying the absence of this cohesion. Zizi Korda will, will raise that with the... Zizi will raise it. He will raise that, yeah. I, I, look, I look at um, a lot of our conversation has centered around what business can do, what government or even the political organizations can do. Um, we're all complaining 
What would it say about us, society, about our posture, response, or lack thereof, as things are happening around and about us? How have we behaved, including you as a citizen of South Africa? I, I think, that, I think uh, given that maybe we have been a little bit too timid in terms of responding to things that are obviously going wrong. I think, I mean, if you take, take this obvious matter that is raised uh, about the, the Guptas and state capture and, and all that, I mean, there's a lot of information out there in the public um, which says what is said is correct. But how, how good, how strong has been our response to all this? Um, Zueli, Vavi, mm. for a long time, had been raising this matter of corruption with Juju races. And I had my I sense that the rest of society was not responding strongly enough to what he was raising correctly. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to have a look at that. Part of the problem is that uh, the democratic victory in 1994 resulted in the demobilization of civil society. Not because anybody took a decision that civil society must be demobilized, but because uh, the people who had been involved in struggle, whether from the church, the trade unions, this and that, the youth, the women, and so on, in the struggle against apartheid, once the ANC became the government, the people say, now we have won, our people, uh, are, our people are going to deliver. So outsource, but we out of trust. Out of trust, and, yes, and, absolutely. And actually, we're tired. We, we wanted to just kind of live trusting that government will govern. Can we just breathe for a second and spend time with our wives and children and work? Sure, trust, confidence, and so on. <clears throat> but see, when situation changes, mm -hmm. requiring that we must be up on our feet again, including me. Yeah. Maybe we've got too custom to relaxing. I think we need, I need to do, we need to be more vocal mm -hmm. and, and really make an impact. Uh, <laughs> Juju, are you recruiting? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I know, I really, I, I think oh, it's... Juju uh, says if you go back, you'll also come back to the ANC. <laughs> 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 no, and I, I think in that yeah. context, yes. and, and I think really in this context given, mm. I think it was important that these foundations of ours, mm. the National the Foundation, mm. decided on this uh, national dialogue mm. to make sure that the people of South Africa take ownership of their future, mm. not just delegate this thing to political parties mm. only. So let's have this national dialogue. Let all of the South Africans participate in this discussion to say what kind of South Africa do we want? What, what is it that has gone wrong, which needs to, we need to put right? And I'm saying in that context, uh, you are talking about business. Mm. I'm very glad, for instance, I was saying to Jabu, Jabu Mabuz mm. that I'm very glad that ESCOM has decided to, Telcom, sorry. Telcom. Telcom has decided to assist in the process of that national dialogue because yes. that's important. Yes. It's part of the process of making sure that our people stand up again, as I'm saying, in order to, de to make sure that they determine the future of this country. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I, I would have loved to speak about education, decolonization of our education. There's so much stuff, guys, but our country has, there are so many questions, and you need to go home. Um, so I'm, I'm going to need to wrap up. The face opposition. The DA is led by a young man. The EFF is led by a young man. France is run by a young man. Recently, the US were run by a fairly young man in Barak. Um, you look at the candidates that Zizi is seeming to be suggesting from the ANC. So far, I haven't seen anyone young raising their hand. I haven't seen Zizi say, I'm running, or David Makura says, I'm running to be president of the ANC. <laughs> What's up? Why is your organization not fielding younger men? I, I think you're right, Razor. The, the question actually needs to be raised with this. Mm. This is why are you not running? <laughs> <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, um, 
Um, I'm going to do the chairman's conversation next year uh, in June. Um, we might need a follow up. I committed to once a year. But, um, Mr. President, I want to thank you for honoring these people in this room, for honoring the people who are listening on the radio and those who have been watching on television. I want to thank the foundation, the Tawambeke Foundation. I want to thank uh, Team Telcom. Um, I want to thank Team Old Mucho. Your 75 years of your life as one of the architectures in, of, of this country's democracy, as we come to know it, um, of the ruling party, of a man respected and loved by his fellow Africans in, across the continent. You go to Cote d'Ivoire, you mention Taiwan Beiki, people go mad. He's a rock star, this man, across the continent. The world respects us. They say, sure, we know, yes, maybe you can't dance, but I know you can sing, <laughs> right? But, gee, man, yeah, hey? So, so thank you on yeah. behalf of all these people. No, thanks, Pat. Thanks, uh, uh, Given, for arranging this. <clears throat>